Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, I'm, I'm Gary, I'm an alcoholic. I'm glad to be here, glad to be sober. Uh, Ricky and I got the Ricky Bobby host. Ricky and his guy Bobby, and we had a good time the other night. And, and I'm thankful to have met you and to have been able to spend a little time with you. Your passion for AA, your love for humanity is exceptional. And I know that God's working through you with these young men that are in your life. You ought to be crazy by now, though. (laughs) So when you're ready to be committed, we have a little place in Colorado that's pretty nice. (laughs) We'll we'll help you, Ricky. Uh, My friend Scott asked me to come, and this is the subject that I was supposed to be speaking on for the entirety of the the conference and i i must say that i'm i'm humbled to uh have been given this subject i am not qualified to speak for alcoholics anonymous as a whole in fact there's a body of people in new york that would rather i just stay home and shut up <laughs> but i have had just short of 30 years experience in general service and 30 years of experience at, at the level of the group. And I suppose with that comes some, maybe qualification is the word, I'm not sure, but certainly some obligation to share some of that experience with you in the course of events. And so, Scott, thanks for giving me the opportunity to address a few things. Just by way of background, uh, I was elected to, I want to talk about a couple of positions at the bottom of the food chain. Most of you probably in here. And I'm, I'm actually a little tingly up here at seeing so many people coming to this. This is normally the carb overload time when everybody goes to the bedroom. You know, and takes a nap, or they're out at the pool playing around and having a good time, and we're in here just uh, toiling, as it were. This indicates to me that there's some level of interest in the subject matter. And I'll try not to, obviously, to disappoint you. Um, we have an upside-down triangle in Alcoholics Anonymous, it, where the groups are at the very top of the of the structure. They have all the responsibility and all the authority. Along the way, starting in probably uh, uh, the late 30s, I suppose early 40s, we began to delegate some of that responsibility down the food chain to positions of ever-increasing disimportance, but ever-increasing responsibility. We found early on that we had to delegate some of these Jobs to people and to bodies and to committees and to eventually boards and to eventually uh, a thing called the General Service Conference. We had to because no one group or no one of us could do these do these services effectively. I I I asked our reader to read that paragraph because I want to talk for a minute. And if this thing is scattered, it sounds scattered. It's because it is. I want to talk about something that bothers me, and it's, it's concerning to me, and that is when we, the groups, place this work on a service plane. We start asking and requesting committees that are underneath us in the groups to do the work that we, the groups, should be doing. The group will survive or die on its 12-step effort. It taking the message to the alcoholic who still suffers And I would add this, where that alcoholic is. We have gotten very comfortable in Alcoholics Anonymous sitting in our fat chairs with our nameplates on them, waiting for them to come to us. Waiting for them to come to us. 
I'm very thankful that Bill, Bill did not wait for Bob to show up at the Mayflower Hotel and see him. He went to see Bob on his ground where he was. And Bob didn't want to have that happen, so they found a neutral corner. And it turned out to be Henrietta's house, the gatehouse. And so we meet the alcoholics where they're at, see. And part of our service committee's responsibility at this is to help coordinate that activity. But lately, because so many of the groups have abdicated that responsibility, the committees themselves end up doing the work. They were never intended to do that. And I, there's no other way to shade this, it seems to me. But what we're going to have to talk about at some point and at some level and with some depth and weight is personal responsibility and group responsibility. We have to talk about these things. And we can't just break it off in God's ass and say, he'll take care of everything. I think he'll, what are, you, what are we going to do when God says to us, that ain't my job. That's your damn job. See what I'm saying? So we have responsibilities to the people we serve as a, as a member of the committee. We have a responsibility to the fellowship that we belong to. And we have a responsibility to future fellows of Alcoholics Anonymous. We cannot be responsible for any of them. But sometimes committee work starts looking like salvation. We're going to go save them. You know? And that doesn't work in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a lot of people spending a lot of horsepower trying to save me. Is it hot in here? God, either that or I got menopause or something. <laughs> you have got the water out of me this weekend. My goodness. <clears throat> I was elected to be a delegate to the General Service Conference Panel 93 from Colorado. That means I served in or Panel 43, sorry. I served in 1993 and 94. I was elected out of the hat. Any of you know what a hat election is? Yeah? Does anybody not know what it is? Okay. Well, in Alcoholics Anonymous, there are people who think that they, if they're elected to be somebody, they'll be somebody. I call these people aspirers. These are people that when you give them a job to do, they're looking for the next job further down the food chain. There's some kind of disturbing idea in their mind that the further down they go, the more stroke they got. And absolutely not true. But the ultimate end game is to prove that you are somebody and to try to become the head sick in Alcoholics Anonymous, I guess. I was elected out of the hat, and I stand before you tonight and tell you it's not my fault. I, it was even money going in. My name came out. A little later on, about ten years later on, they asked me to be a, a trustee on the General Service Board. Let me tell you how that conversation went at home. I said, honey, I'm going to put my name up for uh, Southwest Regional Trustee. And she looked at me with vacant eyes. And she said, I was with you when you were delegate. And I said, I know, but they won't elect this kind of alcoholic to that board. Look at me. They don't want this kind of a rummy on that board. And she looked at me and deadpanned. Okay. A little later on, I got a call from the conference. The current delegate said, congratulations, you're the new Southwest Regional Trustee. I elected out of the hat. It's not my fault. Okay. But now I've got a dilemma. I've got to go up there and tell she who must be obeyed <laughs> that I've been elected regional trustee. And you should have heard that woman scream. She called me everything, I think, under the sun, words conjuncted together that don't belong in the same paragraph. And that set into motion for very long years, very long years. 
So I am one of some 200-odd members of Alcoholics Anonymous in the history of AA that have had the privilege of serving you at that level. Now, i got to tell you, that cuts me out of the herd. I can no longer be naive and vacant and absolve my hands of what I see happening in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've had, like I said, I've had a lot of years in the trench. I know and I see a lot of things. I got to tell you, during that four years, I saw some of the best that Alcoholics Anonymous has to offer, and I saw some of the absolute worst. And it is a real challenge for somebody like me who's pretty intense about AA and intensive about AA. It has been my entire life since I got sober. I've had basically no other life. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't have it any other way. Nor would my family, in spite of all their demonstrations to the contrary. Because they they have seen what it's done for me. And they have experienced firsthand what it has done for us. What it has done for us. What it has done for our community. The people that we love in Alcoholics Anonymous who show up at the house in various stages of disarray. Sometimes with a suitcase, sometimes without. Sometimes with the kids in tow, sometimes not. But they come. And uh, my friend Tom is here. He's a sponsor of mine from Denver. We came out together earlier this week. and He's been to the house, and he's seen what goes on there. It's an AA home, much like many of you have. And there's where we talk about these things called service and personal and individual and collective responsibility. And we spend a great deal of time talking about, more importantly, showing people how to be accountable and responsible. The 12-step work, in my view, is the only thing and the only reason Alcoholics Anonymous should exist. As any kind of an organization, if there is such a thing, the sole purpose of groups to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. For whatever reason, folks, those guys in the, in the beginning figured it out that if they would turn their attention and their thoughts and their actions to the people that were coming up behind them, they got better. They got better. The 12th step, in my view, today, there is more 12th step opportunity than there has ever been ever in the history of of the world, probably. And part of the reason, only part of the reason for that, is the tremendous confidence that the public, the general public has in Alcoholics Anonymous as an institution. As an institution. We've been helped by friends. Ann Landers was a great proponent of Alcoholics Anonymous for years and years and years. No telling how many people came to us because they saw something in a a column about that. No telling how many many members of Al-Anon ended up there. AA has had a tremendous public relations uh, relationship with the general media until a few years ago. Until a few years ago. In the era of expository journalism, you know, the flashbang journalism. Don't write an article longer than it takes to read in the time it takes to take a crap. We have probably induced ADD into society as a result of that. Most of our basic literature, the big book, the 1212, A it comes of age and the book, The AA Way of Life, which today we know as uh, as Bill sees it, contain the basic tenets of our message. Nearly every other piece of literature that we produce talks about implementation of that message. We have, must have, we got a pamphlet. If you got hoof, hoof and mouth, we've got a pamphlet for that probably. We've got a pamphlet for everything. And I don't know how many different ways you can You can explain what we do, but we seem to find new ones every time. Now we're going to start expanding, it seems to be, on areas of spirituality, atheism, on and on and on and on. These are things that we we know very little about, 
uh, yet we think we know everything. And so now we're going to write a pamphlet. That's just one more wasted tree as far as I'm concerned. But we we have decided many years ago, 1950 actually, that this is how we were going to lead ourselves beyond the the co-founders. Let's go back for a minute to uh, 1940, early. The Alcoholic Foundation had been incorporated as an incorporated trusteeship in the state of New York. It had five members, I think, originally. I think your little slide showed uh, the names of the original ones that were on the uh, on the board, the foundation. The book was not yet quite yet published, or it had been published, but they weren't selling very many. And uh, Rockefeller had decided we're not going to get any money out of him. He stuck it to us seven other ways. In the uh, In the history of Standard Oil, which was a Rockefeller company, they called it the octopus. And the reason they did was they had eight ways to get to you. One of them was money. Another was they'd buy out the competition. They'd suck up all the transportation. You couldn't get rid of your product. They'd buy up the buyers that were buying your product. They'd populate your board. They'd buy up your stock. They had a lot of different ways to get to you if they wanted you. What they did with us is they sat back and observed and populated our board with folks that came out of this kind of uh, uh, cauldron of people that were all friends with John D., or they were trying to do suckage with John D. He had all the money, and they're trying to relieve them of some of it. And so these people ended up being on our board for years and years and years. And they were elected through their own processes. They they would find somebody, yeah, I think you ought to be on this board of this alcoholic foundation. We're doing great work and all this and that. What does John D. think of this? Oh, it's a great deal. He's really keeping an eye on it. I want to sign right up for that. So they'd come. We had no means by which we could elect successors. The alcoholics, we were just hoping they'd stay sober through a term. And there was no term. Some of those people served on our board for years and years. One chairman of the board was 16 years our chairman. And we have a set of principles by this time called the traditions. The long form of the night says rotating leadership is best. And yet the board itself was not operating by these traditions. So in 1946, 7, give or take, in comes Bernard Smith. He's not hooked into John D. and the boys. He's an international maritime lawyer, a non-alcoholic. He's at a meeting there by mistake, actually. He showed up, and somebody said, come on in. This is interesting. And he was there for some other business and showed up, and he kind of liked what he saw. Bill happened to be at the meeting, saw him there, and realized that he wasn't hooked into this nefarious den of inequity called the Class A trustees at the time. He went over and glommed on to him like stink on you-know-what. And (coughs) as a result, those two formed a friendship, and that friendship carried on for many years. Many years. And it was through the efforts of those two individuals that we got a general service conference. Bill writes in the literature, and you can read it for yourself. It's in Eight Comes of Age. And it's also in our service manual to some degree. Uh, he, he wrote in there about the need for the, the conference to take over the role of the, of the co-founders. Bob, by this time, had already passed on. Bill knew he was, uh, you know, mortal. And I think uh, personally, this is a personal expression here, I think it was the greatest act of humility in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous by the guy who most people assume had the biggest ego. When Bill said, I am willing to give up all that I have invested in Alcoholics Anonymous to the conference because that was the condition under which the board agreed to let the conference live. Had it not, had Bill Wilson been the kind of guy who sat still when the group decided to have a fight about no smoking or smoking and just gave up, we wouldn't have a conference. And I'll tell you folks, I'm believing as I stand here, we would not be here if it hadn't been for that thing. And why do I say that? Because the foundation was absolutely following the money. The big book by this time was selling 10, 15,000 copies a year, maybe 20,000 on a good year, 1946 as an example, right after the war, some guys getting out. We were selling a few copies of the first edition. 
We had maybe a half a dozen other pamphlets that we were selling out of the office. Some people think that that's how we should have kept it. Okay. Well, we had everybody and their dog out there publishing books, not the least of which was a guy uh, by the name of Ed Webster out of Minneapolis, wrote a book called uh, The 12-Step Guide. And this book later became known, published by Hazelden, called The Little Red Book. And these books were all being produced. Bill would, they would bring them to Bill. Bill would say, let me look at that book. He'd read the book and say, this is a hell of a book. Take it to the foundation. The foundation would say, Bill, we're not going to do anything that takes away from that big book sale. We're not going to do nothing. Take that back. No, thank you. Bill's developing what Charlie was talking about, a resentment. He wanted to write some additional materials. He had wanted to write a 12-step manual similar to what Webster had written. He wanted to write a history of the first then 10 years of our society. Why? So the story didn't get lost and distorted. He had assembled a mass of information that would be helpful in that endeavor. But he was getting no cooperation at all from the foundation. And what Bill had to give up was basically any future status in AA in exchange for the creation of the conference. The conference uh, met officially the first time in April of 1951. I believe it is still a continuing experiment. Bill saw movements like ours. He became a little bit of a student of history over time. He saw movements like ours that had depended on charismatic leadership and the continuance of charismatic leadership. And because of our situation with principles and personalities, he realized that charismatic leadership was not going to be an answer for us. Who was going to be the head sick? Who was going to be the one to replace Dr. Bob? Who was going to be the one to replace Bill? Who was going to be to the one to replace you name them? Who was going to fill their shoes? And so we decided, rightly or wrongly, we decided in 1950 that who's going to handle our overall policy? 135 people assembled in a room in New York City once a year at tremendous cost to the fellowship. And that was one of the biggest objections as to why they didn't want to have a conference. Once Bill agreed to cave in, the foundation gave it up. Bill never really got everything that he wanted. He wanted the majority of those trustees to be alcoholics right from the beginning. And the board said no. He wanted the, he wanted those trustees to be elected by the fellowship through some means. We came up with a plan called a third, third legacy election. How many of you have been at a third legacy election in an assembly or something like that where you have the blind ballots, you go three out of five, somebody comes out of the hat, everybody's giddy? A few of you. Let me tell you something about an election in Alcoholics Anonymous. You might think you're winning a popularity contest. It is my experience in AA we vote against people, not for people. I don't want that guy to get it. I'll vote for her. She's good looking, but that guy, uh, if you win by election an office in Alcoholics Anonymous, you are the least unacceptable person. <laughs> and then to make sure we only give you a job for X amount of time. Two years, you're done. Sorry, you just figured it out. Great, you're done. <laughs> I don't think that's the most responsible thing that we do. I'm not in favor always of a two-year rotation for anything. Sometimes it should be three. Maybe it should be six. Maybe some jobs, like these archives positions that come up once in a while that take a little bit more, maybe they should be ten. I don't know. I can tell you that I got embroiled in a real situation with a manager at the general service office who had been there, in my view, too long. We had one there for ten years. We, it took us forever to get past that one. And this, and this cat was uh, in year nine. And he indicated no willingness whatsoever to step aside. I believe the tradition. I believe it says rotating leadership is the best. I believe that job should rotate. And we could not get the chairman of the board 
to hear the minority. Would not hear it. So we went to the conference, myself and five other trustees, and pleaded our case. It's the second time in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous it happened. I achieved some notoriety as a result of it. Probably why they hate me, truthfully. <laughs> the first time it happened was when Bill was trying to get the ratio changed from a majority of alcoholic trustee or uh, non-alcoholic trustees to a majority of alcoholic trustees. And he filed a report in 1962 that stated his goals. And in the stating of his goals, he said that the General Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous is not following the traditions. It fails to provide for a fellowship-wide election of its own trusted servants. The trustees are automatons that know nothing about the fellowship. They do not leave New York. They never go out into the hinterlands and talk to the people in the trench. They are faceless, nameless. Less than one in a thousand people know a trustee on our board. And I'm against it. And the board said, that's the way it is, Bill. I'm really glad that Bill wasn't one of these pacifists, kumbaya, like the lighters, God will take care of it, cats. He got in, he jacked up his boots and he went to work. And it took him until 1967 to get it done. And I'm convinced that had that not happened, we wouldn't be here. And you say, oh yeah, we would. Really? Can you be so sure? Bill died in 1971. How many people here sobered up before 1971 besides Tom? I don't think anybody would have made it personally. I don't know that what we've come up with is the best possible thing that we could do for Alcoholics Anonymous, but we have a track record now over many years of it functioning at some level, at some basic level. But it, you remember my earlier comment about this, these, these people that think they're going to be elected to something in AA and that they're somehow going to be somebody and that they're somehow going to, as soon as they get a job, they're maneuvering for the next one. And don't tell me you haven't seen that happen. Of course you have. Of course you have. Maybe it's not for a job in AA. Maybe it's, I want to, you know, chair the meetings for a month. Maybe it's, I want to. It's called power driving. That's what, it, that's what it's called. And you've all seen it at some level. We have a class of people today that are serving Alcoholics Anonymous at the bottom of the food chain and the top of the food chain. They're what I would call professional trusted servants, which is an oxymoron every kind of way. These are people that play the service racket. They play the politics. They'll work both sides of the middle. You never know what they stand for about anything of any substance. And then when they're elected to positions of increasing responsibility as they move down the food chain, their true colors become known. And it is destructive. It is chaotic. It does not build unity, and the reason it happens is because members of Alcoholics Anonymous will not make themselves available to this work. We have a magazine. We've had it since the early 40s, mid-40s. It's called The Grapevine. How many of you know what The Grapevine is? Yeah, there's a few, see? A few. You know why they print what they print in there that is so objectionable? Because none of us contribute to it. We don't tell the other side of the story. We don't ask the question of what do I do when my group has absolutely fallen apart around my ears and I'm tired of being the one that's standing there saying whatever I'm saying. And they're picking at me and they've just passed a motion to kick me out of the group. Why don't we write in? Because we just like to sit and bitch. And it's up to us as individual members of, of Alcoholics Anonymous to submit things to them. They used to get 300 articles a month to choose from. Today they get 250 every six months. The pickings are slim. 
Alcoholics Anonymous is a participation sport. It is not a spectator event, and it is not a competitive event. It demands participation from everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous, and yet we don't participate. We'd rather let the magazine die, which is probably really the only way we can reach a, reach a wide cross-section of our fellowship through one thing, if you can get it published. I sent an article in one time about something that, oh, God, we can't talk about that. It's called Recovered versus Recovering. And I guess you probably know what side of the fence I was on with that. I sent this article in with a cover letter to Ames Sweet. He was the editor at that time. And I said, I dare you to publish this and signed it. And he sent back a letter confirming they were going to sign a release, and he said, I'm going to publish it, F you. <laughs> I, I don't care what you think about Aim Sweet, I liked him. I thought he was a good editor. He had a good feel for this thing. And uh, this magazine that we have has been undergoing some degree of controversy for some period of time. You might have heard about it. There's nothing controversial about the magazine. What's controversial about it is we don't seem to know what to do with it. We call it a meeting in print, our monthly meeting in print, which means to me, let's just throw another meeting at the damn problem. Why don't we call it the International Monthly Journal of Alcoholics Anonymous? That's what it was originally chartered as. Why don't we include some stuff from archives in there? Why don't we include some historical stuff? Why don't we put some service-related articles in there? Why don't we deal with the controversies with NAA through the media, through our own media? And what is it about content that we're so afraid that we feel like we have to censor everything? Well, that's not an AA message. Well, that, that's just crazy. That article. How about the one cover with the Picasso-looking drawing of the guy with a Coke spoon hanging out of his nose and a line in front of him? How did that get past anybody? What the hell were they looking? They were on dope themselves, probably. <laughs> God almighty, how did that happen? And, and you know what the response was from the editorial board? We thought the picture had good color arrangement. <laughs> Where are we getting these clowns? Because nobody who's apparently a member of Alcoholics Anonymous makes themselves available for this work. Tom and I were talking last night. I don't want to steal any of his thunder. But we were talking about the appalling percentage of participation financially and in other ways with our conference. Our conference. 20-some percent and change in some areas. Some areas in the United States and Canada single-digit percentage contributions of groups to the General Service Office. Eight percent, nine. What are these other groups doing? What are they doing? Nothing. I am not going to go down the bad road and say that it's willful. I do not believe that. I believe it's we don't know any better. And so those of us that are in the game, in the trusted servant arena, we're not playing politics. As you can clearly see, I'm not very politically correct. I've never aspired for any job I've ever had in AA. God and the group decide. I've made myself available. That's all I have to do. I have to ask myself a couple, three simple questions. Could I do the job if asked to do it? And my answer up to this minute has been yes. I could, and if I couldn't, I would make arrangements such that I could. What is the term of the job? What will my employer and my family say? I'm self-employed, obviously. I do not work and play well with others. <laughs> so I have to ask myself, well, are you going to be able to do this? And then I say, yes, I, I will be able to do this. And then 
I have to do this for the full hitch, for the full hitch, whatever that is. <coughs> but this business of the way we elect trusted servants, I think, is fundamentally a good way. But we have got to get members of Alcoholics Anonymous that actually do 12-step work and don't use service activities as a substitute for spiritual action. In these jobs. And to do that, you have got to find a way to make yourself available. If you're 12-stepping people and you have some basic understanding of our 12 traditions, and some basic understanding of the 12 concepts. Why in God's green earth are you not making yourself available to this? And do not stand there and tell me that you're too goddamn busy. Don't tell me that crap. I know people in this room, and I am not including myself in that class. I know people in this room who have given their lives to this program. And they have done it come rain, snow, bankruptcy, doesn't matter. Damn bit. They've gone right on. Happy, cheerful, a lot better at it than me. Okay? And they've done yeoman work for Alcoholics Anonymous. We are going to blow this thing to hell from inside, not outside. doesn't matter what's going on out there. It's inside that counts, and we're going to do it to ourselves. If we don't find some way, somehow, to get... Mem- I'm talking... God, I don't want to go here. I'm going to go there. (laughs) I served on this general service board. There's supposed to be 14 Class Bs, alcoholic trustees. I grabbed three of them in the middle of a board meeting and took them in the corner. I said, I think it would be helpful if we elected alcoholics as Class B trustees. And I looked them right in the eye. And I said, if you can't get anything from what I'm saying, we need to go outside. We have charlatans posing as alcoholics who have managed to fall down through this food chain because nobody else wants to make themselves available, and they are in positions of responsibility on your board. If I was an alcoholic and a member, I would would be calling somebody, and I would be getting on a plane or doing what I had to do to find out what the hell is the problem here. Now, I'm washed up. i got no more. I'm not going anywhere. I've hit the bottom of the food chain. I can't go any further. And i got no aspirations. Never have had. And I'm from out of town. I'm going to leave. You guys are going to be stuck with what you heard here today. And I don't know any way to sugarcoat this or color it up and make it pretty. You know, you can you can make anything look like anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. And our ability to take a huge problem and paint it up and make it look like it's an attraction is there's something wrong with us there. We have an, a real hard time facing the truth about what's going on around us. And it, when all else fails, just break it off in God's ass one more time. It's his fault. God needs us on the ground, boots on the ground, walking, doing this work. This is where we operate, folks. If I sound preachy, I apologize. Not really. (laughs) I have nothing to lose by standing up here, but I am not going to stand idly by while everybody else is wanting to light the lighter, sing the group song, Kumbaya, when I see what I see going on you got a couple of operating boards out there that are running away with this fellowship and the program. And we used to be a a society that had some business to do. Today, we are a business, a publishing business, that has some spiritual activity. I don't know when that changed, but it changed. And if some members of Alcoholics Anonymous don't go back there as delegates, as area chairs and start talking about this crap at the grassroots level, which is at the top of the food chain, we're going nowhere quick. We'll never survive the Internet revolution. We have depended wrongly on big books to bail us out of everything. And big book sales are falling off the map. You know why? Because people are buying them online. And that's going to continue to get worse as time goes by. And there is no end of it in sight. 
Nobody's making any money on electronic publishing that I can see. Whether that changes or not at some point, I don't know. Why does Alcoholics Anonymous have to depend on literature sales to support its services in the first place? Because the groups won't support the deal. And we have worn a dollar out. We have worn that thing out. I'm going to close with a story I've been going about right here. We're tired, I'm tired, my ass is flat, and I'm standing up. <laughs> I was on my way to somewhere. I like eating burritos in bars early in the morning. It's just a thing. And this nerdy-looking, boulder-living, probably yuppie, comes by me, and he's telling the bartender, I want a double shot of Jack Daniels neat. Now, when I was flush, that was the elixir of the gods. The rest of the time is four roses. But double shot Jack Daniels neat. Now, I'm listening to this. I'm eating my burrito. And the bartender comes back and says, that'll be $8. I said at the top of my voice to nobody in particular, $8? <laughs> Little Mr. Yupster Sprout Eater looked at me and said, where you been, old man? Where have I been? I disregarded him as if he were a mollusk. <laughs> but I began to think, what is it about me, what does that say about me, that I won't put the price of one drink in the basket when it comes by? What does that say about me? Why don't we consider putting the price of one drink in the basket? Jeez, it's better than a buck. Now, some of you are going to say, I think I can buy two shots of night train for a buck. <laughs> and you can. But I found, in my experience, winos are not to be trusted anyway. <laughs> Anybody that would live off the, the fruit of the grape, they've got real problems. You've been very patient, very kind. You've been very, very hospitable to me and, and obviously to Tom. Tom's sister is your treasurer. This world of Alcoholics Anonymous is a very small world, very intimate. We know each other pretty well, and we run into each other as we go. When they talk in the end of the book about you will surely meet some of us, who are they talking about? I am a fortunate member of the Parker Group in Parker, Colorado, but I belong to the only group in Alcoholics Anonymous and that group is AA as a whole. I would hope that you would find your path to participation in and belonging to the whole of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's much bigger than you and I. It's much bigger than that little old group in Parker. It's much bigger almost than the heaven that we touch when we come together in truth. And God will protect us from ourselves and will protect society from ourselves, provided we are willing to trust God and clean house. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.